You know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swallowing like six. Did it perfect to the kid. Got a million who's single, my hate and nothing better. Put on the road, I just win. I know we got a million dollars, the devil that's it, and I chip it again. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the first part of, What If Naruto Joins Star Wars? Special note, this fanfic is written in a masterpiece of Neon Zenjetsu on fanfiction.net. Do check and support the author too. Now smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. Sup? Name's Naruto, Shinobi Extraordinaire, Assassin for Hire. Perhaps you've heard of me, Shinobi Menace, Tatooine. The suns burn down out of a cloudless blue sky, washing the vast desert wastes of the planet in brilliant white light. The resultant glare rose off the flat, sandy surface in a wet shimmer of blistering heat to fill the gaps between the massive cliff faces and solitary outcroppings of the mountains that were the planet's sole distinguishing feature. Sharply etched, the monoliths stood like sentinels keeping watch in a watery haze. When the ship streaked past and into the atmosphere, engines screaming roaring with ferocious hunger and relentless drive, the heat and the light seemed to shatter and the mountains themselves tremble because this was no simple ship that fell from the skies. It was a man, his body battered, his clothes tattered, it was a marble he hadn't yet burned up in his return to the atmosphere. Still he plummeted, the ground rushing up to greet. It was early fall and the heat was searing. He squinted into bright sun as the dust devils swirled about him, kicking up little puffs as he jolted toward the ground. He closed his eyes at the very last instant and braced himself for the inevitable pain, the jolting agony of the incoming impact. Having awoken earlier to find himself airborne was nothing as he compared it to just how rough his landing was about to be. Something cracked across his face and sent him sprawling. Something hard and infinitely unyielding. It was the earth. He slapped into the ground hard and with zero control, broken body flipping over as he skidded onto his back. He bounced one, two, three, four times before the momentum of his impact drove him back to earth. His head kissed an iron hard root, made all the worse by the thickness of his skull. Black spots swam before his eyes and left him blind. He tried to stand, and sorely regretted it as a broken rib all but drove the breath from his, his lungs. Up, damn you, get up. Swearing and spitting he got on his hands and knees and tried to stand, eyes watering, ears ringing, pushing his hands against the gravely and granite soil. He'd made it all of halfway, a half-assed oath leaving his lips before the shadow fell upon him, before he raised his gaze and realized what exactly he was looking at. He'd landed in a massive crater, packed and flattened by the impact of his landing. And the ache, it was everywhere, absolutely everywhere, radiating outward in his back, shrieking in his spine, even breathing was an effort in and of itself. He couldn't quite pinpoint where it was or where he was for that matter only that there was no conceivable way he'd last long in this heat. Unable to sustain the effort required to stand, he flopped onto his back, all semblance of calm evaporating as gazed up into the blazing sun of the seemingly endless desert. Where was he? How had he gotten here? This field he'd landed and should have been bursting with wheat ready to be harvested. Instead, it was severe and dry, almost as if the life itself had been sapped from the soil. It was an eerie, time-consuming thought, and one he could not afford to entertain. The clouds were gathering in overhead. A sandstorm of sorts must be coming. He tried to stand, tried to force his body into some semblance of movement, in hopes of finding shelter before he was struck by the full brunt of blast. Once more, he tried to stand. Fucking shit. To say that he failed miserably would have been a massive understatement. He swore, then laughed. It was a harsh, bitter noise. Even in death, he'd picked up his wife's foul mouth. The thought was almost enough to drive away the sorrow subsuming every inch of him. Almost. He contemplated rising even tried to but the crushing weight of his own agony prevented him from moving so much as a millimeter. A gnawing desperation clawed at him and he frantically patted himself down to ascertain where the pain was coming from. Flak jacket. Check. Slacks. Check. Arms. Check. Legs oh. Agony gripped the man, his vision dissolving into scarlet streamers as his fingers closed around the mangled mess that was his right leg. The knee had been all but pulverized during his landing. It hadn't been severed entirely thank Kami for small mercies but his relief died when he saw the blood. He'd bleed out if he didn't do something, and soon, raising an arm, he tore off a sleeve and in swift, hurried movements that bespoke of years of practice, proceeded to tie a tourniquet around the wounded limb. An animalistic hiss of pain slipped through his teeth as he tied the knot tight around his thigh and bound it fast, slowing the flow of crimson vitty between his fingers but not staunching it. 
Within seconds the dark fabric was soaked through and through. He could feel his vision beginning to blur, his hands growing cold. God, it feels like we just got run over by the Jiuyubai. A rough voice scraped at the inside of his head, interjecting itself amidst the pain. Oi, you there, Gaki. When silence prevailed, the voice tried a more familiar approach. Come on Naruto, talk to me. Belatedly, he felt his wound begin to close, the shattered knee and broken bone spur stitching themselves back together, flowing like emlick molding across his flesh. And yet he was barely aware of it at all, as if the event were taking place outside himself and he were merely a bystander. Boy, Naruto found himself yanked inward, hauled into his self to confront the very creature to whom he owed his life. Hirama towered over him, long since freed from his cage, eyes narrowed in sheer disbelief at the irreconcilable behavior of his host and partner. Naruto blanched at the balefire in his eyes. Despite their numerous conversations they'd held within his mind, he simply couldn't help but gawp at the sheer size of the Kitsune. A very angry Kitsune, at the moment. What in the nine hells is wrong with you? The Biju roared, nearly deafening the blonde. Are you trying to die? Maybe, Naruto replied, drawing a startled hiss from his tenant. Not on my watch, the fox said, his lips drawn back in a snarl. Have you forgotten that if you die, I die with you? Despite himself, the man Naruto managed to laugh. Nice to know you still care, hub Kirama. The Kitsune sniffed. You're not getting rid of me that easily, Kit. Konoha's last hawkage chuckled, but there was no longer any mirth to be found in his smile. He no longer had anything to smile about. His village was gone. His people destroyed. The war against Abido and Uchiha Madara had dragged on for years, and though he'd seen the death of many in that time, it was ultimately the death of one that affected him the most. In the end, it was not the passing of Sekura Haruno nor the murder of Uchiha Sasuke that shook him the most. It was the loss of his wife, of Teuya. Kabuto's Ido Tensei had brought back countless individuals from the dead. The flute wielder had merely been one of them, captured for study near the beginning of the war. That she happened to recall the seals to release it, to bind her soul to her now supposedly undying body, had been something of a boon. They hadn't been the best of friends at first, even less so given the manner of her captivity, but over time he'd warmed to her, and she him. As much as a foul-mouthed, ill-tempered redhead could, he supposed. She'd even married him, although her condition prevented any chance at raising a family. For a time, he'd been happy. He dared to think all would be well, that they might just escape the war with their humanity intact. But as Naruto soon learned, one did not underestimate the power of the Rinnegan, nor its power to simply rip a soul from its body. Everything had gone downhill after that, sanity included. His desperate, last-ditch one-man suicide attack against the pair had led to thus, to the warping of time and space itself, hurling him from Konoha and sending him somewhere else. One did not carelessly hurl a Baijudama against a space-time ninjutsu and expect to live to see the next sunrise. He'd meant to die with the madman, but instead he'd wound of here. Where was here exactly, anyway? He almost thought it was the land of wind, but no, the Jubai had reduced Gara and his village to molten slag over the course of the war. This land, though unbearably hot, was not at all glassed, nor was it deprived of life. He could sense others in the distance even without use of his cloak, just as he could tell that this place was nowhere near Kanoha. He blinked, driving a bead of sweat from his eyes. He could feel the grains of sand at his back, intermingled with the scent of fire, the unamused and smoldering irises of heat and hell itself, come to claim his life. Hot. It was just too damn hot. What was the point in getting up? Precisely. There was no point. All his friends and family his wife were dead. Best just to lay, to perish, and let all and any trace of his existence be swept away from this strange, alien world. At least then he could join them. Are you all right? Or not? Yuzumaki Naruto creaked open a blue iris, momentarily alarmed to find a young woman standing over him. Long strands of dark hair framed her face, all he could see against the blinding glare of the sun now wait just a minute. He must have hit his head harder than he'd thought, because he could have sworn he saw two suns glaring back at him. A pair of bright, angry eyes punishing him for his desire to give up and die. Surely he was seeing things. Well, hello there, Hirama rumbled, and Naruto thought he detected a hint of satisfaction in the old Kitsune's tone. What do we have here? Teuda, Naruto muttered, holding out against hope that this was a dream. But this was no dream, and his wife would never say something like are you all right. And indeed, as he stared up into the twin sons of Tatooine, he gradually came to realize that this was not the foul-mouthed redhead whom he'd come to know and love. It was someone else. It was a girl. Um who is Teuya? She asked. Naruto opened his mouth to reply in kind, to ask who she was, snapped it shut again. Pushing against his elbows, he forced himself into a sitting position, took every inch of her in. 
neither tall nor short, skinny nor fat, she radiated concern on an almost primal level, her dark eyes boring into him with anxiety and concern. Her clothing was simple to the point of being rustic, dark, dusty attire, evidence of years spent in the arid atmosphere. She blinked down at him with soft, brown eyes another reminder of the love and life he'd lost her heart-shaped face framed by long, raven tresses, blacker than pitch. Anyone who saw her would have been hard-pressed to believe that this girl this beauty amid the sands had survived so long in such harsh terrain. And yet, clearly, she had. Who are you? S-H-M-I. The girl smiled and for a moment just a moment it seemed to outshine the sun itself. My name is SHMI Skywalker. A flicker of hesitation shone in her eyes. Your leg is it. Naruto was momentarily at a loss for words, unable to understand what she was alluding to. Then he realized. His leg. There was no longer any wound with which to concern himself, but the blood from said wound still stained the sands, now dried and old. Oh, this? He chortled softly. It's nothing. Just an old wound. Oh, thank goodness. Her features softened in relief. I heard an explosion so. His stomach rumbled. Naruto managed a foxy grin. SHMI was it. The girl's face darkened. Her cheeks dusted with the lightest flush of embarrassment. Why yes. Do you have anything to eat? Perhance. Nine years later. Get back to work, boy. Grimacing at the vehement shouts of his Toydarian master at his back, Anakin Skywalker bolted into the scorching afternoon to repair his wants. He was a small boy, even at his nine years of age, rather compactly built, with a mop of sandy hair, blue eyes, a pug nose, and an inquisitive stare which often brought him more curses than it did blessings. I'm going, he grumbled beneath his breath, trudging towards the ruined wreck that, only a few hours ago, had once been a pod racer. I'm going. He lost another race, thanks to Sebulba's dirty tricks. The foul-mouthed dove was infamous for doing whatever it took to win a race, oftentimes that meant cheating. More than once he'd nearly driven Anakin into a wall, nearly cost him his life. On multiple occasions, he'd simply wrecked his pod, putting Anakin and by definition Watto weeks behind in repairs. Uo, it made him so mad. If only the dove didn't cheat, then he wouldn't win. He kicked at the loose sand with a foot and in a rare bout of uncharacteristic anger, flung a string of curses at the twin sons of Tatooine. Ichu Ta, his defiant cry tore into the sky, echoing onward, falling silent. Anakin glared up into the suns for a moment longer until both his eyes began to burn, and, finally, tore his gaze away. Sighing in frustration, he turned and went out the back of the shop into the kicked at the sand again as he crossed to the engines and the pod the droids had dumped there earlier. Already his mind was working on what it would take to try and make them operable again. Even from here, across the yard, he could see the right engine was almost untouched. If he ignored the scrapes and tears in its metal skin. The left was a mess, though, and the pod was battered and bent, the control panel a shamble of sparks and circuitry. Fidget, he muttered softly, a spark of anger igniting in him as he drew closer, saw the extent of the damage. Just fidget. He was quick and strong for his age, and was gifted in ways that constantly surprised those around him. He was already an accomplished driver in the pod races, something no human of any age had ever been before. What's more, he was gifted with bilfing skills that allowed him to put together just about anything. He was useful to Watto in both areas, and Watto was not one to waste a slave's talent. But what no one knew about him except his mother and another was the way he sensed things. Frequently he sensed them before anyone knew they would happen. It was like a stirring in the air, a whisper of warning or a suggestion that no one else could feel. It had served him well in the pod races, but it was also there at other times. He had an affinity for recognizing how things were or how they ought to be. He was only nine years old and he could already see the world in a way most adult never would. For all the good it was doing him at the moment. For all the good wait a minute. Anakin blinked, suddenly terribly aware that something wasn't right. It wasn't so much a sense of wrongness as it was out of place. He sensed something. Someone like him. Again it wasn't a prickle of danger at his back. But rather, a sense of familiarity. Of nostalgia. A presence. He was closer now. Close enough that he could hear sounds coming from the right engine. Sounds that it should not be making. Anakin was close to it now, perilously close, so much so that he could even hear voices. Damn, Attica, you really beat this engine up while I was away. Tools scraping against steel pierced the air. That's the last time I take a job for Django, eh? Blasted dickhead of an asshole, keeping me on Camino for three months. Anakin bristled as a snatch of Manda the native language of the Mandalorian people reached his ears. He knew only one of the legendary warriors, but that shouldn't have been possible. He shouldn't couldn't be here. It had been three months since he'd last seen the man board his ship and take off for parts unknown. 
There, a matted mane of shaggy blonde hair could be seen peeking out from behind the pod, and as he looked a harsh clang cracked inside the engine, punctuated by an equally harsh Huddy's curse. Fearfic. Another clang, punctuated by another curse. Restraining a grin and a shout of delight Skywalker crept toward his pod. There could be no denying it now, even in the slow setting suns of Tatooine. He knew that voice, just as he knew. Don't even think about it, Annie. The young Skywalker started, momentarily startled as a pair of hands grabbed him by the shoulders and spun him about, bringing him face to face with the T-shaped visor of a Mandalorian. There was a brief snake of dread, coiling in his stomach, before he recognized the odd patchwork of orange and black and crimson peering down at him. As ever, the blonde was wrapped in heavy armor. Rumor had it he'd bartered with a Mandalorian some months before for the prized suit of steel he now wore. Said to be capable of reflecting even a lightsaber, nothing short of a turbolacer could hope to put any real dent in Mandalorian steel or Naruto while you wore that suit. What did I tell you about sneaking up on me? A whiskered face poked out of the pod, bright blue eyes peering out at him beneath the harsh suns of Tatooine. Yuzumaki Naruto, all of 30 years old, stared back at the young racer with something akin to a frown, but not quite a smile. His expression said it all. To not to, Annie tried to focus his gaze on the floor, but an exasperated sigh from the blonde brought him up short. Naruto was smiling. Hey, this is what I get for trying to surprise you with new parts. He said, toss me that Hydra spanner, will ya? Why can't you get it? Because I asked you, kid. Naruto's tone dropped a decibel in a warning. He wasn't kidding. Thou get it already. I can't hold this power coupling together forever, you know. Anakin shrugged and reached for the nearby kit, risking a glance for Naruto as he did. Lacking only the distinctive T-shaped visor and helmet PF his counterpart, and bristling with an array of gadgetry that would make a lesser man flinch, the blonde looked equipped to take on a small army. But it was not an army that had startled Anakin. It was the man's uncanny ability to be in two places at once. Not even a Jedi could do that make an exact copy of themselves and send it out to do their bidding. And Naruto said he could create dozens, hundreds, if need be. He wasn't called the Menace for nothing. The Shinobi Menace was his real title, but Anakin had no idea just what a Shinobi was supposed to be. He was more in awe of Naruto's many techniques and tech than he was curious about the man's myriad past. You gotta to teach me how to do that. Anakin directed his words not to the duplicate at his back, but toward the man in the pod, uncaring as the doppelganger at his back vanished, dissipating in a plume of smoke. It was a trick that no longer fazed him, but one he longed to replicate as he crossed to the battered blonde and handed him the requested tool. Just the thought of being able to be in two places at once sent a silent thrill through him. It's not a skill I can teach. Naruto laughed as he took the tool, his bulky form disappearing into the engine briefly, before emerging. Anakin watched the bounty hunter tinker with the pod for just another instant, and then he rose, towering over him in all his glory. Anakin watched with awe-filled eyes and inevitably found them straying towards the man's jetpack. The sleek, curved form of a deadly MM5 missile jutted out of it like the horn of some ascient beast. Yuzumaki Naruto grinned, wiped a gloved hand on a piece of cloth, and slung himself out of the pod. Anakin fought the urge to run to the blonde, knowing the man would doubtlessly chide him for his childish behavior. If there was anyone he cared for just as much as his mother, it was this man. He'd always been around, as far back as Anakin could remember, and yet he was never a slave to Watto, unlike them. Naruto represented the one thing he wanted more than anything else, freedom. The chance to go wherever you wanted, do whenever you wanted, however you wanted. He'd sworn up and down he would buy them both out of slavery someday, not just he and his mother one at a time, but together. But being a bounty hunter was dangerous and expensive work. There was the upkeep of his own tools and then the pay wasn't always steady. You were paid for a bounty, and you needed to keep taking bounties if you wanted to keep getting paid. And sometimes you had to kill people. Anakin didn't think he could do that. He just wanted to stop being a slave, to be able to go anywhere he wanted with his mother, and never have to hear Watto say anything. Rasid we kappa, Pete uncle, speak of the devil. Anakin, startled, in spite of himself by Watto's abrupt reappearance and the fresh burst of huddies, had just enough time to watch his mentor don the helmet and dip behind the engine before Watto swooped down on him, bursting from the back of the shop and starting in on him again with a fresh burst of insulting adjectives. You're slacking off again, aren't you, boy? The Toydarian shrieked, the full force of his fury focused upon Anakin once more and convinced he'd caught the boy, neglecting his duties. Do you have any idea what your laziness is going to cost me? Do you have any idea at all? Obachika, the pudgy body lurched forward with each epithet, 
causing Anakin to step back in spite of his resolve. Watto's bony arms and legs gestured with the movements of his body, giving him a comical appearance. He was angry, but Anakin had seen him angry before and knew what to expect. He did not cringe or bow his head in submission. He stood his ground and took his scolding unflinchingly. He was a slave and Watto was his master. Scoldings were a part of his life. Besides, he wasn't alone this time. I shouldn't let you drive for me anymore. All three fingers of Watto's left hand pointed at him. That's what I should do. I should find another driver and sell you and your mother to someone else. Scarce had he said them however, than the distinctive click of a safety being removed, answered. Naruto had since stepped out from behind the engine, and now he was armed. Watto froze in mid-rant, alarmed to find himself staring down the long barrel of a blaster. Although Anakin could not see the blonde's face, he was certain positive that the shinobi-turned Mandalorian was surely smiling behind the mask. Phew, Watto barked, blustering at the crimson-clad hunter. What are you doing here? Hi Chuba da Naga, Stupa. Naruto replied in greeting, choosing a language that offered a vast array of insulting adjectives he could draw upon. What do you want, stupid? The casual insult was almost enough to make Anakin laugh. Almost. Even so, the Toydarian's reaction was priceless. His pudgy body lurched backward a few centimeters, striking one of the pod's old engines in a sea franty attempt to get that blaster out of his face. Tudu. Naruto simply tracked with the movement, never taking his gun off the snarling alien. There was another clock as he flicked its setting from stun to kill. Wait, wait. Watto begged. Don't shoot. I give you a discount, yes. Naruto growled behind the helmet. I don't need a discount, you know. For a wonderful, terrifying moment, Anakin actually thought dreamed that the Mandalorian would take the shot. But although Naruto refused to lower the blaster, he did not fire. Stop shrieking like that, he said, directing his words to the floundering alien. You're embarrassing yourself. Watto hauled himself back into the air with a sharp string of curses, his wings a blur of motion. Beating, with such ferocity, it seemed as if they would surely fly off his lumpy little body. Anakin stifled an urge to laugh as he imagined this happening. It would not do to laugh just now. Anakin knew the Toydarian would wind down shortly soon. His anger released in a manner to satisfy his need to cast blame in a direction other than his own, and things would go back to normal. Only, this time, they didn't. Ah, uh, Watto stuttered, his courage evaporating now that he'd found himself face to face with the Shinobi's arsenal. Naruto, to what do I owe this? Pleasure. He practically squeaked out the last word. As the Mandalorian jammed the blaster against his stomach, the deadly weapon pushing into the alien's pudgy abdomen with enthusiasm. I've got enough credits for SHMI. He said it almost casually, his words flat and baritone through the helmet, as though they were discussing the weather and not the Skywalker's freedom. In another year, I'll have enough for Anakin. You know what the means, right? Watto made a sucking noise with his lips and glared bloody red daggers at the boy. He knew what that meant, as did Anakin despite what his ignorant master thought. Freedom, you can't take the boy. Watto protested, suddenly sullen. I need him. For the races. They are. His words ended in a yelp as Naruto jerked his wrist to the right and squeezed the trigger. A blaster bolt cut across the space between them, passing dangerously close to the Toydarian's midsection. Anakin was at a loss for words. That was just so incredibly cool. Watto didn't seem to share his enthusiasm. The pudgy Toydarian's face was drained chalk white, evidence of the close call he'd suffered. Too bad. Naruto shoved the now steaming blaster in the alien's face. Ten years. That was our deal. Time's almost up, and I've got a pretty little bounty coming that'll take them off your hands for good. Of course, I could always shoot you now and deactivate the bombs inside them myself. Would you prefer that, Watto? Th that won't be necessary. Watto sputtered with a fluttering of his wings, tripping over the words in his haste not to wind up dead. So long as you pay me for them dot 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 you can have them. I'm so glad we understand each other, Watto-san. Naruto slung the rifle over his back with a smugness that told Anakin he was smiling beneath the helmet. Anakin held no doubts. If it came down to it, Naruto could shoot Watto dead with little to no compunction and leave with a clear conscience. He almost hoped he would. The thought frightened him. This anger he felt, it was terrifying at times. Hey at the very least you're being reimbursed for them. The blonde was saying to Watto as Anakin came back to himself, a sly smirk in his words. Lucky for you I don't like to shoot my employers. So why are you here, now, then? Watto snarled, biting out the words. If not to shoot me, and not to claim them, then why even be here? Just visiting my kid. Naruto replied and suddenly his hand was there on Anakin's head, muscling his hair, much to the boy's infinite embarrassment. Got a problem with that, dickat. Watto's mouth worked as if chewing something incredibly foul, 
his snout wrinkling over his protruding teeth. The blaster in his face, however, dissuaded him from saying anything foolish. Anakin, meanwhile, felt his heart leap into his throat. Naruto always called him his kid whenever he visited which was often and not for the boy to wonder as to his parentage. He wasn't quite sure if the bounty hunter really was his father or not and oftentimes he didn't bother to think about it. But it was times such as these that he truly did wonder. Was Naruto his father? They shared such similarities. He and him and the way SHMI his mother, still young, beautiful beyond measure spoke of him sometimes. Now, do you have that part I've asked for? Naruto asked Wado, breaking the boy from his thoughts again. My stabilizer's shot to hell and back and without it, I'm stuck on this mud ball. Of course, of course. Watto smiled a smile that looked entirely forced. Come into the shop. We can talk business. Anakin watched the Toydarian flutter away. Stuck out his tongue when he was certain the pudgy little alien wasn't looking. More the loss for their little encounter, he doubted Watto would do anything to harm him anytime soon. He might spit and swear, but beyond that he had precious little to fear from his master anymore. Only one more year. One more year and they would have their freedom, he and his mother. The thought nearly made him swoon. Hatun. Naruto spat at Wado's retreating form, his words so soft that Skywalker had to strain to hear them. Now, Anakin knew precious little of the Mandalorian language, Manda in some circles, but he did know that word. Coward. Wado was a coward all right, with a capital C at the very beginning. Bah. Naruto surprised him by removing his helmet and spitting a wad of phlegm onto the sand. I really want to shoot him sometimes, you know. Anakin couldn't contain himself anymore. This time he really did laugh. Naruto shot him a sharp glance but did nothing to try and dissuade the boy from his mirth. And for that, Anakin was most grateful. Naruto let him laugh, and it wasn't all that long before he joined him. In that moment Anakin wished more than anything that Naruto was his father. Alright kid, I need to go talk business for a bit. The bounty hunter sighed. Tell your mom I'll be over later, nay. Can't you teach me that trick of yours before you go? Anakin half begged at him, knowing the blonde would refuse him, yet still desperate enough to try. Naruto regarded him intensely, sapphire eyes boring into his own as though searching for something or another. Whatever it was, he seemed to find it. Like I said, Adika, it's not something I can teach you not easily, anyway. He paused, seemed to consider it this time. But that has to be the millionth time you've asked me that. You really wanna learn. Anakin nodded emphatically. I thought you wanted to be a pilot. Naruto laughed. Or a racer. Those two. Fine, fine. A sigh snake passed his pursed lips, twisted into something that was almost a smile. You're a little younger than I was when I tried this technique but there shouldn't be a problem. I should warn you before we begin, though. I'm one hell of a teacher. Anakin gulped at the hunter's terrifying expression. Maybe this wasn't such a good idea after all. Hunter, you coming or not? Watto barked from the shop, his harsh, guttural voice slicing through Anakin's thoughts like a plasma torch through Durasteel. Naruto chortled softly to himself, almost as if Watto's pathetic attempt at intimidation could somehow amuse him. He crouched low to tousel Anakin's hair once more, his words deep and reverberating beyond the mask. We'll talk after dinner, kid. You're staying. Anakin guffawed at him, his words torn somewhere between a laugh and a cry of disbelief. Naruto scoffed and donned his helmet. He was the faceless shinobi menace once more. SHMI would murder me if I didn't try her cooking. Anakin agreed wholeheartedly. No one cooked quite like SHMI Skywalker and her meals were always something to look forward to. Hunter, Wado roared. You come in here now or I charge double. Naruto straightened up, the joints in his armor creaking as he stood to his full height. Coming, Naruto chuckled as he paced away, long strides carrying him towards Watto's hut. See you at dinner, Annie. Yeah. And as he turned to go, Anakin thought he caught a glint of silver hanging at the blonde's waist. He risked a glance over his shoulder, curiously aroused. And then he saw it. A small, narrow cylinder just large enough to wrap a hand around. A hilt of some sort. He'd seen one before in the hall of its. Recognition crashed down on him like a wave, drowning him in a surcers of thoughts and whispers he'd seen that hilt before. He knew what it was. A lightsaber. That was a lightsaber. Anakin knew it far too well. But only Jedi had those. Naruto wasn't a Jedi was he? If so, then why did he take on bounties? If he wasn't, then what was he doing with one in the first place? Anakin had heard tales of Jed and their powerful weapons, capable of slicing through just near anything. 
He couldn't imagine a Jedi parting with their weapon on any sort of willingness. He watched the only man he thought of his father retreat into the darkness of Watto's shack, and couldn't help but wonder, just who was Uzumaki Naruto? Night blanketed the vast cityscape of Coruscant, cloaking the endless horizon of endless spires in deep velvet layers. Lights blazed from windows, bright pinpricks against the black. As far as the eye could see, as far as a being could travel, the city's buildings jutted from the planet's surface in needles of steel alloy, and reflective glass. Long ago the city had consumed the planet with its bulk, and now there was only one city, the center of the galaxy, the heartbeat of the Republic's rule. A rule that some were intending to end once and for all. A rule that some despised. Darth Sidious stood high on a balcony overlooking Coruscant, his concealing black robes making him appear as if he were a creature produced by the night. He stood facing the city, his eyes directed at its lights, at the faint movement of its air traffic, disinterested in his apprentice, Darth Maul, who waited to one side. Had he focused upon his apprentice, he might have noticed the fury the young Zabrak was currently experiencing. Because Darth Maul was furious, the dark side wrapped itself around him like a second skin, clinging to his torso in a writhing nexus of hate and fury, itching to lash out at the first available target. A target found in himself, in his own self-doubt and inability. The Zabrak assassin was irked beyond all semblance of tranquility. He longed for the chance to seek the one who'd first instilled this rage in him, take his throat in hand, and squeeze the life from him. The man of this man, you ask? The Shinobi menace. One might have thought it mere coincidence when he first encountered the hunter in pursuit of Lorne Pavlin. Maul did not believe in coincidences. Perhaps it was a test of the dark side that first placed this foe in his path, this immovable man wrapped in a suit of Mandalorian steel, armed with weapons ranging from a blaster cannon a wrist-mounted flamethrower to a lightsaber. Maul would have thought him a former Jedi, had he not displayed zero aptitude in THS Force. The bounty hunter, upon identifying himself as the Shinobi menace recently returned from Kamino made no use of the fierce offense form of Adaru, nor did he try to rely upon the reserve weighted out defense of Sorsu. He simply attacked. Even for Maul, trained killer as he was, it was too much. It was as if he no longer cares whether he lived or died, like a black demon had taken over his soul, and devoted every aspect of his being to killing. Before Maul knew it, he'd lost an arm to the maddened Mandalorian, an arm now replaced by a prosthetic. It had been a nightmare. No, scratch that. His life had been a nightmare, from the moment he first met the menace. Flashback. Oi oi, what do you think you're doing here, Dickut? That voice, and the distinctive snap hiss of a lightsaber were Maul's only warnings. And even then, they nearly came too late for him to do anything about it. An emerald blade sliced through the permacrete where he'd been standing a moment before the sudden assault bifurcating the solid stone with a single sweep. Maul cartwheeled backwards, anxious to put distance between himself and this unseen assailant. His mind was racing, even as he struggled to come to terms with the sudden attack. Why hadn't he been able to sense him? He whirled, searching for another attacker, and, finding none, began to wonder if there had been one at all. But there was none. The eerie thrum of the second saber was gone and he saw only his prey, the silver-haired Padawan, Darsha Asant gawping back at him. She clearly hadn't expected the abrupt intervention. Either, still can't see me. The voice taunted, resonating from the empty warehouse. And try as he might, Maul could not. There was nothing there for him to sense. It was as if the being were actively masking its presence in the Force or perhaps the truth was it simply did not exist in the Force. Was it a droid, then? No, that voice had been far too human. Maul growled, scanning his surroundings for any sign of disturbance. There, the air between him and the Jedi Padawan seemed to blur ever so slightly, as if a giant hand had reached out to pluck at the atmosphere itself. And then, there he was. The stealth field dissipated with a sibilant hiss to reveal the slim, armored form of a Mandalorian warrior. Clutched in his hand, the hilt, pommel of a lightsaber. He stood at least a full head taller than Maul, his T-shaped visor betraying nothing of the man lurking behind the helm. Manda Drardi Jediakat. He spoke in fluent Mandalorian, and Maul silently thanked himself for the language lessons Sidious had drilled into him all those years ago. A Mandalorian never forgets the sound of a lightsaber. He turned to regard the Padawan leaving himself open to attack, but Maul couldn't bring himself to strike. It was the perfect opportunity, and yet, something held him back. He felt only dread when he looked at this man, finally feeling his presence in the Force. It was as if he were a giant not in the flow of reality, his very existence a giant boulder around which life itself was forced to flow, for there could be no brooking passage through him. Just what was this man? Kaponi gone, Jedi. 
The man rumbled in his native language. Darsha jumped, her brow crinkling in confusion, baffled by the language barrier. The warrior laid a hand upon her shoulder, his helmet inclining a mere fraction of an inch as he awaited her response. Be beg your pardon. Something akin to a sigh resounded beyond the man's helm. He took his hand away from her shoulder, knocked it against his helm in exasperation. Parchek, he muttered, cursing himself. Damn it, I said, you need a hand. The Mandalorian returned his gaze to Maul, and something seemed to click into place behind that black visor. With this one, Darjatai, Sif, he was speaking to him, Maul realized. This man knew he was Sif. He swept his lightsaber up into his hand and ignited it on instinct, both blades sprining from either end. He would not let them live, either of them. The Padawan edged forward in return, only for the Mandalorian to push her backward. Kayuar, the commando barked at her. Hush, might want to stay out of this one, Syarika. The hunter beckoned the Padawan back. I don't think you'll be a match for him as you are. He flicked his wrist and the lightsaber came ablaze once more, casting him in its eerie green pallor. He settled in a stance Maul didn't recognize, one leg before the other, the weight on his back foot. Maul hesitated, not because the Mando had called the Padawan sweetheart but because the Force was screaming at him, telling him to run, to flee, to get as far and away from this man as possible. Maul carefully ignored this fear and turned it into anger, and anger into hatred. His golden eyes blazed with the power of the dark side, empowering him with its might. Just thought you should know the name of your killer, Sif. The armored man laughed. They call me the Shinobi Menace. They're going to call you dead once I've finished with you. Maul hissed, bringing his saber staff blade to bear. Odd. He felt no fear from the menace, only the resolve to kill. It was a refreshing feeling, to face a warrior as devoted to death as he. It was almost a shame he had to kill him. Ni shabrid ni darjitai. The Mandalorian cackled and suddenly his body began to glow gold beneath the armor. Maul frowned, reluctant to press on the attack until he was certain of what he was seeing. The man's armor seemed to melt and become part of the golden glow, his opaque visor becoming transparent, reflecting the cruel, crimson eyes within. His mouth curved upward in a smug smirk, and it was only then that Maul understood the weight of his words. Don't underestimate me, little Sif. With a war cry that could put the rankers of Dathomir to shame, the golden Mandalorian brought his blade to bear and flung himself forward. In flashback, Maul shuddered at the memory. Whatever ability it was, it had proved too much for Maul. Though he'd managed to strike down Pavan and escape with the Sith holocron in his life he'd been forced to leave the wounded Padawan and her hunter friend behind. It was either that or risk certain death. And Maul, devoted to the Sith way though he was, hadn't been about to risk his life over a single Padawan and the hunter just for the sake of pleasing his master. Now, he regretted the decision, sorely regretted it, as he awaited his master's inevitable response to his words. His yellow eyes glimmered with aggravation and anger as he waited for his inevitable punishment. I sense fear in you, apprentice. Sidious's words were barely a whisper, barely audible over the winds of the Coruscant sky, yet Maul heard them nonetheless. Why is this, Maul? Maul seethed. You speak true, my master. He inclined his head, the mosaic of his face betraying none of the humiliation he felt. Due to my fault, the Jedi are aware of us. Perhaps, Sidious demurred. Perhaps not. They may be aware of you, however. The younger Sith fought the urge to snarl at this, the reminder of his failure. Not only had the hunter managed to confound him on Coruscant some months before, he'd even managed to wrest the Pado and Darsha Asant from his grasp, thus informing the Jedi of the emergence of the Sith. But the Trade Federation blockade was already nearly in place, his master assured him, so nothing of true value had been lost. Maul disagreed. He had been shamed by the menace. His pride had suffered a blow, one he swore to strike in return at the first opportunity. He would find the menace and make him suffer as none had ever suffered before. He would find his friends and family, everything he held dear and he would kill them. Make him relive the same shame and humiliation he had thought to experience. What is thy bidding, my master? Darth Sidious stared out into the lights of Coruscant as though he could somehow divine his answer among them. Maul was impatient. He wanted vengeance. They gained nothing from waiting. Already they were exposed thanks to the menace, and he was hungry to repay the debt he owed the hunter for the loss of his right arm. You will find this menace, and you will eliminate him. Sidious advised softly, the cowl sheltering the smile of his face. If he is truly such a threat as you say, then we cannot allow him to interfere with our plans. Maul fought the urge to roar in sheer triumph. Instead, he exhaled sharply. Satisfaction permeated his voice. I will have vengeance, then. You shall, Sidious answered. So shall it be, my master. Maul bowed and turned to leave. In Maul, Sidious's words rooted him. I will not tolerate failure a second time. 
Maul scarcely even heard the words. He was already stalking away, already making plans for the future. There would be no failure this time. He would succeed. He would be prepared. He would find this menace and he would kill him. And he would relish every moment of it. Meanwhile on Tatutine. Oh, that smells good. Anakin looked up at the exact instant that he heard someone step through the door of his home. Naruto. That voice caused him to cease his work upon C-3PO's left eye and hazard a glance to the dusty archway, as though he could somehow confirm the speaker's identity merely by listening in on the sudden conversation. As the boy listened, he could make out the distinctive thud 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 of boots coming from the main room. He risked a wry glance at the corners of his own room. Adobe walls, whitewashed and scrubbed, glimmered softly in a mix of storm-clouded sunlight admitted through small, arched windows and a diffuse electric glow from ceiling fixtures. A sandstorm had sprung up after Hiwato had sent him home for the evening and he'd begun to fear the worst for the Mandalorian. Apparently, he had been wrong to fear. Anakin cocked an ear and subsequently winced as he heard something shatter. His mother must have dropped that plate she'd been cleaning moments ago. Naruto. He heard SHMI Skywalker exclaim. Her words caught somewhere between a gasp and a sob. Anakin dithered just a moment longer, uncertain as to whether he should listen or make himself inevitably his curious Sadie won the day. Stepping so softly slowly so as not to make himself heard, the young Skywalker rounded the bend and peeked around the corners of his room. Finding no one, he crept toward the kitchen, where he finally found Naruto and his mother in the man's arms. Her face remained buried against his chest plate, her arms wrapped around his chest in a fierce embrace. She was speaking to Naruto saying something but her words remained muffled against the hunter's chest and were lost to Anakin stifling any chance he had of deciphering her words. The same could not be said of Naruto. He discarded his helmet. Anakin could see it upon the countertop and without it, the Mandalorian's words were as plain as day to him. And he's getting so big. Naruto was murmuring to his mother. Syarika, you should let me train him already. Don't you sweetheart me. SHMI surprised Anakin, both by understanding the Mandal language and by extricating herself from his arms. I don't want that kind of future for him. Jedetai, saying please won't help your case any. She shook her head emphatically. He deserves a better life than that of a bounty hunter or a oh, I'm sorry. Her dark eyes softened as Naruto cringed. I didn't mean it like that. It's nothing. Naruto was quick to mollify her. I won't train him if you don't want me to oh. He winced as she touched at his shoulder, flinching in pain. His face screwed up in visible agony as though she'd touched a burning brand to his right arm, although she'd done nothing of the sort. It's nothing. He promised at her worried expression. Just an old wound I picked up on a job. Mom, honey. His mother lurched backward in surprise was she blushing, almost as if she were ashamed of herself. Yuzumaki Naruto grinned back as he caught sight of his young protoge, whiskered cheeks dimpling in a smile, hands reaching to muss the boy's sandy hair. Naruto demurred with a soft smile. SHMI Skywalker fixed him with a withering glare. Dinner's nearly ready. Naruto made a noise that Anakin acquainted to acquaintance and took his seat at their dusty little table. His knees knocked against it, nearly sweeping the food clear off the table had his hand not shot out to snatch back the plate at the last instant. SHMI shot him a withering look and the blonde offered a sheepish grin, as sheepish as a someone of his stature could manage. Over the years, his mother hadn't seemed to dot 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 well, age in the conventional sense. Her movements were as fluid and graceful as they'd been when he was a babe, a fact that Naruto seemed content to comment on whenever he visited. Indeed, SHMI's face lacked the lines and creases of most women her age although her eyes always seemed brighter somehow when Naruto was nearby. So how did you get that blade? The menace waggled an eyebrow in bemusement. You really wanna know? Yes. Anakin watched in eager earnest as the hunter steepled his fingers and leaned forward, blue eyes glimmering with intent. He thought he caught the softest of smiles from his mother out of the corner of his eye. Well, I once met a Jedi Knight on a bounty. Naruto began slowly, weaving the tangled tapestry of his tail with an ardor and enthusiasm only a true hunter could produce. Great man. Impressive man. A finer one I've never seen. Turns out, he and I were after the same target. Some Corellian lowlife, wanted for acts of terrorism against the Republic and crimes upon humanity, blah blah blah. That wasn't important to me. He held up a gloved finger, emphasizing his point. What was important was this, the Jedi did I mention he was a master. Wanted him alive. I didn't. The contract specifically stated the bounty was for his death, and his head to be mounted on Jabba's mantle. I knew where he was, but the Jedi he was a stubborn one wouldn't let me find him or kill him until he had the chance to question him. 
of course. I wasn't about to let him abscond with my bounty right under my nose, either. It was an impasse. Eventually I drew on him and our little disagreement turned violent. So you killed him. Anakin felt his heart sink into his stomach. It must have shown on his face, because the hunter was swift to deny this claim. Of course I didn't kill him. Naruto admonished, disbelief coloring his words and twisting at his face. Do you have any idea just how difficult it is to fight a Jedi, Annie? Like trying to get a Kawakian monkey lizard to shut up? That's how. And you can forget about killing one. Anakin felt himself heave a heavy sigh, felt relief crest over him in a wave of understanding. He knew on a fundamental level that a bounty hunters often killed their quarries in the hunt. Just as he knew Naruto rarely ever accepted low-paying bounties unless they involved a particularly corrupt or wicked individual. It was part of the reason he'd garnered the title of menace in the Outer Rim. Once he was on the hunt he was just that, a menace. To the cruel and a vigilant knight to the kind. Those are A. Then another problem crops up. This Corellian guy. He's under the protection of a nasty old hut back on Nal Hutta. And my employer wants him. Badly. So we end up storming the palace, defeating the guards, causing chaos in general. And by the time we find the criffing little bastard, he's locked himself in a cell to keep us out. Apparently, he doesn't know who he's messing with. Anyways I reach out rip the door off its hinges, and that's the end of that. So what happened next? Anakin found himself hanging on every word. What did you do? Do. Naruto scoffed. I hauled him out of there and shoved a blaster in his face, of course. He continued his tale with a sly smile all his own. So now he's making noises of panic and pleading that I hardly notice anymore. Naruto. Anakin blinked as SHMI admonished the blonde. Anyways, he's pissing in his pants and begging the Jedi for mercy. Please, don't let him kill me, Master Jedi. He's offering us everything he owns, credits, his fortune and then he makes the mistake of offering me the one thing you should never ever offer up. Flashback. Menace, I have a beautiful daughter. Naruto growled, blue eyes narrowing to bloody slits behind the T-shaped visor of his helmet. Arden Dine, his target, the man who dared offer him his only daughter, was a portly, heavyset man, balding, and somewhere in his mid to late forties. One mistake too many had first placed the menace on his trail some months before, and he'd been a hard one to find. Their chase had led them through the underbelly of Coruscant, the lush landscape of Corellia, and now the seedy back alleys of Nal Hutta herself. After three months and some bit of assistance the menace had finally cornered his prey. Now, here Arden died lay, his back pressed up against the wall, his collar trapped in the inescapable grip of a Mandalorian crush gauntlet, the barrel of a blaster staring down his face with cold lethality. Arden was a man who sweated heavily under stress or duress, and it was with a cold cruelty that Naruto savored his sweat-soaked terror as he stared down the barrel of the gun. His clothes were soaked with sweat, face slick with perspiration, chest heaving, as the menacing Mandalorian hauled his pudgy body up off the floor. Near moments ago, he'd been making him offers all the way back to Coruscant, promising a starship, a planet anything to survive. Now, he'd offered his daughter, never use your kids, scumbag. Never. He shouldn't have said that. Now Naruto was angry, and he didn't often get angry anymore. In that instant the only thing he wanted to do was kill. To end the life of this feeble little wretch, squirming within his grasp. He'd never had a family himself. Always wanted one, yet never had the chance to raise one. And yet, this man offered up his blood, kin, his daughter without so much as second thought. Mistaking his silence for contemplation. Please, menace, I'm sure she'll satisfy you. Chuba. Naruto hissed in huddies, the loose term for you. His helmet barreled forward to strike the man hard in the face, splitting his skull, his head lolling to one side, mouth hanging open. Naruto promptly shoved the barrel of his blaster into the gaping orifice, flicked the setting from stun to kill, tightened his finger on the trigger. Wait. A strong hand clasped his wrist through the armor, locking his muckles in place, preventing him from pulling the trigger. The shinobi menace bit back a growl, his helmeted head turning marginally to regard the terrorist's unlikely savior. It was the on-the-man's defender. If you know what's good for you, qui gone, you'll let go right now. His words were harsh, biting in their tone. He'd deign to use the Jedi's name for once, but make no mistake, if this man didn't let go right now he'd be joining this dicka, dead, on the floor. Naruto had yet to kill a Jedi up close or otherwise but in his present state he had no qualms about doing just that without so much a second thought. It was only the memory of their previous encounter that stayed his free hand from going for the holdout blaster in his sleeve, or turning the wrist-mounted flamethrower on the Jedi. The man's appearance certainly didn't help him any. Qui-Gon was a tall, powerfully built man with prominent, leonine features. His beard and mustache were close-cropped and his hair was worn long and tied back. His face stood pinched in concentration, 
evidence of the substantial effort required to restrain the younger man, to prevent him from pulling the trigger and ending the Corellian's life. Naruto allowed his gaze to drift, his HUD scanning for any sign of weakness in the Jedi's stance. There were none. Tunic, pants, and hooded robe were typically loose-fitting and comfortable, yet the longer he looked the more they seemed to swirl with an unseen wind, the unnoticed breeze pushing the sash back just enough to reveal the cylindrical hilt dangling at its side, just out of view but within easy reach. Naruto watched his hand brush across the hilt, not in warning but in that age-old gesture which warned of danger. He felt the thin threads of the force pluck at his mind, realized the man was trying to calm him, and stubbornly resisted. Let me interrogate him first. The Jedi argued. Let me kill him first. Naruto retorted. Qui-Gon's sharp blue eyes fixed on him. Don't try it. Naruto whipped his blaster around in the same instant that Qui-Gon ignited his lightsaber. In the split second that it took for him to bring the blade up and then down he remembered the man's Mandalorian armor. His lightsaber skittered off the arm of the hunter's gauntlet, drawing sparks and leaving a blistering welt, but leaving the hunter very much unharmed. Qui-Gon had less than an instant to see, recognize, and process this before he felt the barrel of a blaster press against his forehead, effectively ending their standoff. Naruto's eyes seemed to gleam behind the T-shaped visor of his helmet. His words trickled out in a sibilant hiss, little more than a whisper in the palace dungeons. Dopomi gusha, pidunki. You feeling lucky, punk? Qui-Gon was not feeling very lucky at the moment. Already the Mandalorian had surprised him once before during their last encounter. It was as if here were dense in the Force itself, almost incapable of using it. Yet nothing short of Qui-Gon's greatest efforts could move him more than a few feet. And even then it wasn't much. Trying to push him away was like trying to move a mountain. While his own force-enhanced reflex enabled him to outpace the blonde's reactions, it was only by the barest of breaths. However, just because he couldn't influence him, didn't mean he couldn't influence events outside of him. An errant glance quickly confirmed the location of the door the hunted had thrust aside earlier. From there it took precious little concentration for one of Qui-Gon's caliber to send the rusted iron hinges hurtling toward the bounty hunter's back. Naruto staggered forward half a step, and then the jetpack kicked in, sending him screaming upward, and out of harm's way toward the ceiling. Qui-Gon watched him alight on a nearby ledge, eyes narrowing to beady slits. That was low. He hissed. Qui-Gon shrugged as the ladder leapt down from his perch, his boot landing solidly in Arden's stomach. The man produced a soft wheeze as the breath rushed out of him. For a moment it looked as though the Mandalorian might shoot him. Finally, a low hiss left his lips. Let's make a deal. He offered. I let you interrogate him and you give me your lightsaber in exchange. The Jedi shook his head. You know I cannot part with my weapon. Menace bit out a single phrase in his native language. Ki Nudgerkatter Shaw Mandaid. In flashback. Ki Nudgerkatter Shaw Mandaid. What does that mean? Anakin asked the hunter, unable to understand the flowing syllables. Naruto grinned at him, a soft twinkle in his starry blue eyes. It means don't mess with Mandalorians, Annie. Naruto answered, picking at his food with a fork. Anyway, I caved toward the end and let the Jedi interrogate him. Then, instead of killing Arden, I freeze the dickhead in carbonite and cart him back to the ship. Guess the Jedi rubbed off on me. That still doesn't explain how you got the lightsaber. Anakin pointed out. I'm getting to that. The hunter protested sullenly. Turns out he was so impressed with me after all, Naruto Finchhead, that he gave me this. He patted the hilt at his belt, fingers tracing over the intricate designs etched into the handle and hilt. His lightsaber. The confirmation that this was indeed a lightsaber and... Can I see it? You really wanna see it? Naruto chortled. Yes, Naruto. Sh Mai's voice was full of reproach. I'll be careful. Without another word he pushed himself away from the table and pressed the trigger. The lightsaber sprang forth like a genie from a bottle, giving life to a brilliant blade that leveled out after only a few meters, creating a sword of pure energy. Naruto held it aloft, skin swathed in emerald glow, the blade casting a ghostly green pallor across the confines of the hut. He performed a few practice swings for emphasis, the blade rumbling like thunder as he twisted and turned the hilt. Anakin was left in awe, watching as the hunter effortlessly bent the weightless weapon to his will. Here was a sword he'd learnt to wield only after hours of long, painful practice. Wow. Anakin gawped. That's just wow. The hunter shut down the blade and hazarded a grin at the boy. I'm glad you like it, Annie. Now, why don't you show me that protocol droid you've been working on after dinner? Can I show you now? Anakin casting a pleading glance at his mother, practically begging to be excused from the table. Oh, alright. SHMI relented. 
just this once, awesome. Anakin all but bolted from his seat, there one moment, gone the next, darting around the bend and out of sight. So how did you really get that lightsaber? SHMI asked as soon as her son disappeared into the machine shop that served as his room. She knew Naruto far too well to believe that a Jedi would merely hand over their most prized of Pisisians to him, merely on a whim. The hunter lasted all of three seconds beneath her piercing gaze. Then he crumbled. Come on SHMI Chan, don't you believe me? Naruto. There was a long, painful moment of silence. I may have won it in a game of Sabak. Naruto admitted sheepishly once he was sure Anakin was safely out of earshot and certain not to overhear. I also may or may not have cheated. Naruto. SHMI swatted him on the wrist. So that whole story about meeting a Jedi was a lie, then. Not all of it. The blonde chuckled as he watched the boy work on his secret pod. It really was true right up until the part where we went our separate ways. Turns out he didn't have much of a poker face. Hell, if the rest of the Jedi were like him, we just might get along. Naruto. What? The hunter protested. It's just a memento. That's all. Not like I'll ever see the guy again, eh? He reached down to pat the hilt, only to realize it was gone. It took him less than a second to discern where it had gone and who was currently trying to take it apart and reassemble it again while he pretended to activate C-3PO. Harchek. Naruto spat. Damn it. That's not a toy, any. Light years away, qui Gon Jin, aboard a Republic vessel bound for Naboo, in the midst of carefully constructing what would prove to be his new lightsaber, sneezed. The sudden sound drew the attention of his Padawan, Obi-Wan Kenobi. The learner of twelve years couldn't help but to notice his master's sudden exhalation, and felt inclined to comment on it. Though safely in hyperspace and en route to their diplomatic envoy to the Trade Federation, he couldn't shake this sense of unease, nor could he seem to recall just where his master had lost the lightsaber. There had been that time when they had been on separate missions some months ago, but he was almost certain his master had returned with his lightsaber at that time. So when had he lost it? Master, why are you constructing a new lightsaber? He asked. Hui Gon was silent for a very long time, as though searching the force for the proper explanation. When he finally replied, it was quiet and stoic dot 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 and very much a lie. I lost my old one in a furious duel. Omic, I'd like to test your midichlorian level as well, just to be sure. Naruto shrugged and removed a glove. He really didn't see the point in this, but what the hell. Whatever you say, Jedi. Within seconds the skin was pricked, the blood scanned. Hui Gon blinked in surprise at the reading and showed the sample to his apprentice. It's over 9,000. Hui Gon arched an eyebrow at his apprentice. I'm sorry, Master, Obi Wan said, somehow managing to look both abashed and embarrassed at the same time. The Force just wanted me to say that, for some reason. Why did you let me die, asshole? Naruto lurched upright and out of the dream, instantly awake and on high alert. Heart pounding, pulse racing, he nearly cried out as his mind snapped back to the world of the living, barely checking himself at the last instant. Just a dream, he told himself, fists bawling beneath the blankets. It was just a dream. An old, cold, painful specter of the past, recurring on occasion, one that should hold no bearing upon his future. Only it did. He was certain. Teuya's and Conan's deaths kept haunting him, mocking him. The former's death at the hands of Madara, and the latter at Abido's, had left an indelible mark upon his pish. At times he could almost hear their voices. I miss you, darling. Sometimes he could even see them. Blue eyes cut a swat across the room, fixating upon a solitary figure, hunched down against the wall. He knew her azure hair and amber eyes without looking, just as he knew her hands were cradling the gaping hole in her slightly swollen stomach. He bit down on his bile, teeth sinking into his lower lip until he tasted a flinty, metallic taste upon his tongue. Blood. His blood. Why won't you look at me? Naruto shook himself heavily, refusing to look the mortally wounded woman his former fiancé in the eye. Of course he wouldn't look at her. To do so would be to acknowledge his own madness. Part of him knew why he was seeing this. At the climax of the battle, he'd fallen under the influence of the moon's eye plan albeit briefly with its eternal Tsukiyomi. Although he'd broken free before the battle's end thanks to Kurama's aid, one did not simply rip themselves out of an all-powerful Jinjutsu without some sort of side effect suffered in the end. Perhaps that was why he'd been fool enough to shove a full-powered Baijudama at them. In Naruto's case, he believed he was slowly losing his mind. It was slow, gradual, inexorable. He saw those who weren't there, was visited by haunting dreams, a maddening case of Peronia. And of course there were the voices. Although, he stubbornly believed those were of his mind's own creation, not the dementia. Traitor. He almost started when Teuya's hazel gaze appeared before him, 
bisecting his thoughts. Almost, but not quite. The redhead was glaring bloody red daggers at him, her pale dead face mere centimeters from his own, twisted into a rictus of fury. He took some small solace in the fact that this figment of his imagination so resembled the original, that she and her cohorts only ever haunted him at night. As horrible as they were, he could tolerate them at night. He didn't think he had the strength to ignore them in broad daylight. Why did you have to let me die? She hissed at him. Her breath smelled like death in his nose, tasted like rot on his tongue. You were standing right there, and you didn't even try to save me. Naruto said nothing as Tiyuya railed against him, sitting silently by, whilst she assailed him with endless accusations. He knew by now that there could be no pleasing her, no matter what he said. He'd given up on that long ago. Now, he no longer bothered to listen. Sighing, he allowed his eyes to drift shut, drawing in the natural energies surrounding him. For all her arid atmosphere, Tatooine sustained a surprisingly large amount of energy for him to draw upon. Flushing his veins with it seemed to be the only way to banish the visions and the voices sometimes. You never loved me. She spit in his face. Not then. Certainly not now. You no good two-timing piece of shit. Be gone. Naruto hissed eyes bursting open. His lids dusted with orange. His orbs flashing gold. Teuya flinched as though she'd been struck. Still he daren't relent. He glared bloody red daggers at the apparition of his wife until she finally crumbled. Fading to black. As though she'd never been there to begin with at all. With a supreme effort of his unquenchable will, the former shinobi pushed himself back to the present and focused firmly upon a portion of the wall, until he was absolutely certain the ghost of his past was indeed gone. Only then did he dare to exhale. Just a dream, just a dream, just a dream, just a dream. He checked the nightstand for his blaster, and upon finding it, immediately stabbed a hand beneath his pillow for the kunai, fumbling with the pillowcase for the deadly dagger. Then and only then when he finally felt the cool grip of his father's cherished knife between his fingertips, did he take a breath and check his surroundings, reminding himself where he was, who he was with. Oh, now he remembers. Kirama's voice reverberated deep within his mind, laced with slumber and perhaps just a sliver of amusement. Naruto forcibly bit back a reply of his own. He knew his tenant-turned-partner still enjoyed getting the occasional rise out of him. Ordinarily, he didn't much enjoy it. But tonight, it served as further proof that he was indeed awake and would not be all that haunted by the ghosts of his past tonight. Night had fallen upon Tatooine, her twin sons having long since set. A curtain of velvet darkness lay draped across upon the desert. All was quiet. All was still. Somewhere in the distance, a crate dragon's roar resounded through the desert, its deep howl sending silent shivers shooting down his spine. Naruto sighed, the tension draining from his features. All was well. Naruto, SHMI Skywalker lay beside him, head nestled into his chest, the smooth dip of her waist nestled oh so subtly against his own. Her long, dark hair, normally bound back behind her head lay across her back in loose layers, obscuring her nakedness where the think blankets could not. He touched a hand to her cheek, and SHMI stirred against him, the softest smile wreathing the tan features of her face. She was as beautiful now as she was the day they'd met. Maybe more. Suyur, Kirama goaded, and the fact that you've given her a few throbbing chakra injections had nothing to do with it, right? Oh, shut up. Naruto bit back a sigh. SHMI had been a bomb for his soul when he'd first found himself stranded here. She'd taught him how to speak basic, how to handle even the most complex of blasters. And then he'd discovered the awful truth. SHMI was a slave. She had no life, no freedom to call her own. He would soon learn that slavery was a welcome and accepted practice upon Tatooine, and to free any slave especially one as sought after as Shimmy required a large sum of money something called credits to free her, as Watto had so bluntly informed him. Back then well, Naruto hadn't so much as a credit to his name, and the Toydarian certainly wasn't going to free SHMI on goodwill alone. Seeing no way to earn her escape at the time, he'd resolved to free her the only way he knew how and well that hadn't gone over well. They'd gone only a few paces from the homestead before SHMI told him about the transmitter inside her, that it would detonate if she tried to escape. Despondent and left with little choice in the matter, Naruto had resolved to buy SHMI from Wado. That, too, had been the undertaking of a lifetime, one that might have been downright impossible, were it not for his talent. Naruto, despite all protests to the contrary, was a killer. Years at war had stripped away his naivete, leaving him with a stone-cold resolve to attain victory by any means necessary. While he did not relish the idea of taking a life, he was willing to end one if that was what it took to get the job done. 
one could not become a shinobi and be expected to spare a life in the line of duty, not the life of one who'd stab you in the back at the first opportunity. He began by taking odd jobs for various individuals, made a name for himself slaughtering sand people. But it wasn't until he learned to pilot a starship and finally scrounged up enough creds to purchase one that he actually considered the life of a bounty hunter for himself. Of course, few wanted to risk hiring a rookie, but there was good money to be made at the best of times. During those jobs, it was the memory of SHMI and Anakin the boy who just might be his son that kept him going. It would be some time later before he met Jango Fett and became a true hunter, a Mandalorian, that had been fun, and by fun Naruto meant excruciatingly painful and frustrating. Back then, the man had taken all his tricks head on and matched him not blow for blow, but with strategy and cunning. Were it not for the powers of his own Jinchuriki cloak, he would have certainly lost his life that day. Who would have thought there was a material that could actually prove resistant to his Racingen and Racing Shuriken? SHMI might have made him knowledgeable in the ways of the galaxy, but it was ultimately Django and five years of pure hell that made him into a true huntsman. From thence, Naruto resolved only to hunt on his terms, to seek out wicked individuals with bounties on their heads. Thus the shinobi menace was born. Suddenly, he was on the grid as Django would have said. No longer did potential employers thumb their noses or what passed for noses in some cases at him and his offers. Nay, clients were scrambling for him to hunt down their targets. And hunt them he did. From the core worlds to the outer rim, not a single target escaped him. He was named the Menace, for he was a menace to his prey, as inescapable as the dread they'd feel once they realized he was on their trail. Only death or capture awaited. Sometimes the former was preferable to the latter. One thing would eventually lead to another as he tracked down bounty after bounty. Four years later, and here he would find himself today. To this very day, he still wasn't entirely sure if Anakin was his son or not. SHMI refused to elaborate whenever he broached the subject, and although he had his suspicions, he was reluctant to press her now, just as he'd been when he'd first discovered she was pregnant. Now that had been a shocker, still, the resemblance was there. Sandy blonde hair, bright blue eyes, that same inquisitive streak he'd had as a lad. Anakin might be his kid, but what if he wasn't? Shaking his head, the Jinchuriki extricated himself from the covers, donned his leathers, and made for the door. He paused as a gling of silver on the nightstand caught his eye. His lightsaber reassembled after Anakin's bumbling attempt to discern its inner workings lay just out of reach. He reached for it, the smallest of smiles twitching at his lips. Just touching it evoked Qui-Gon's shell-shocked expression, his look of complete and utter shock, as Naruto won the hand of Sabak and subsequently claimed the blade as his own. What a memory that was. Who would have thought Jedi had such sucky poker faces? His fingers closing around it, the Mandalorian shinobi paced out the door, stepping into the cold night of Tatooine. He drew in a deep breath, holding the hilt in a loose, one-handed grip, savoring its feel, the modifications he'd made. It was no longer the weapon of a Jedi, but of a Shinobi. It was his weapon, a shield to protect those he loved, a sword to cut down those who dared seek their harm. Flicking the hilt, he ignited the blade. Instead of the eerie green cadence of before, a marvelous magenta greeted him. He'd found that, though he lacked the means to wield the Force conventionally as a Jedi did without tearing the galaxy a new backside it was not beyond him to change the color of the cold crystal itself. Chakra, both his own and that of Kirama's, had molded the jade crystal into something else, creating a blade he could proudly call his own. He'd taken great pangs to etch a simple sigil into his new trophy, the likeness of a lone leaf, a silent nod to his days as a shinobi. Days long behind and past, times remembered with longing and pain happiness and sorrow. The color was fitting, he thought, given his union with Kirama at the outset of the Fourth Shinobi War. Violet, neither scarlet nor sapphire, neither light nor dark, but somewhere in between, straddling the line between good and evil. This blade, though not his primary weapon of choice, the very essence which a Shinobi possibly the last one in existence stood for. He found the Jedi Order and the Sith repulsing as a whole. The former's tendency to shut out even the most base of emotions reminded him of Danzo's root whereas the latter's obsession and perversion of the self was downright sickening. Better just to wipe them both out. Well, except Qui-Gon. He was alright. For a Jedi, there was also that Twi'lek Jedi he'd met a few years back. Now that one, she had one hell of a body. What was her name again? Ailey. No. Aya. No. Ayla. Getting sentimental. Kit. Hardly. Naruto scoffed at the notion, refusing to even consider such feelings for a woman he barely even knew. Jedi shunned emotion, anyway. Even if he did find her attractive which he did not mind you. He hardly expected her to return his feelings. Besides, I'm just enjoying my new trophy. Whatever you say. 
The Kitsune groused. Although you could always stand to find another woman. Like hell, don't be like that. I'm sure your wench won't mind sharing. So you'd rather I set a bad example for Annie, then? Like father like son. Naruto stumbled half a step forward. His distraction nearly cost him an arm, his grip on the hilt bringing the blade dangerously close to his face before he managed to divert it. Oi, he scowled at the close call. The hell, I'm hardly father material as it is. Naruto chortled as he danced away from an imagined lunge, shifting his hold on the lightsaber into a reverse grip, molding the movement into an effortless one-handed parry. I only see the kid once every few months and even then it's usually only for a few days. Yep, certainly no father of the year award, there. Hey, Naruto flinched at the charine in his partner's words. It'll all change once they're free. You just wait and see. Ah yes, your brilliant yet deluded plan to ride off into the sunset and live happily ever after, was it? I'm sure that'll work out for you. Well, when you put it that way it sounds far-fetched. That's because it is, boy, says the lovelorn fox. Naruto snorted. Kyuubai growled. That was low. Sorry, it's not my fault I'm so damn picky. The years might have made him a Mandalorian, but he was still very much a shinobi at heart. He had enemies, many of which wouldn't hesitate to use SHMI or Annie against him. The moment they were free he intended to get them off this kami forsaken dust ball, and somewhere safe. He just didn't quite know where that somewhere was yet. His ship was a fine vessel indeed, but it was by no means a place to raise a nine-year-old child. And for the life of him, he couldn't think of any other place. Coruscant naturally came to mind. Even so, he couldn't quite shake the bad feelings that he felt whenever he visited the planet. He doubted he'd run into that Zabrak again. But even so, watch the leg. Kurama's warning jostled Naruto out of his reverie and just in time. He'd been perilously close to slicing his own leg off in his inattention. He performed a few practice swings of the blade, allowing himself to become lost in the blazing colors of the blade until the motions became automatic, his body performing feints and jabs against an unseen opponent. He was half tempted to create a shadow clone, but doing so would likely wake his family. Family, such musings brought a small smile to Shinobi's face. Blood or not, he had a family here. He was still smiling, as he performed a precise repost and closed down the blade. A faint light greeted his eyes as the sword shrank down into the hilt. The twin sons were beginning to rise once again. He'd been practicing far longer than he'd thought, and yet he felt barely winded. I think that's enough for today, he decided. Agreed, was Kyuubai's blasé reply. I'd rather not spend another week regrowing your limbs. Touching a hand to his wrist communicator, he summoned his ship. Better get the stabilizer installed. The next morning, Pudu, a sharp, Huddy's profanity rang across the sands of Tatooine the next morning, an explosion racing hot on its heels. Anakin awoke to the smell of smoke and the sound of Huddy's curses ringing up and down the yard. He rose from his bed with a start, only to find his mother already at the door. She was clad in little more than a robe, as though she'd woken in a hurry. Pete Uncle, Naruto was heronging a soot-covered duplicate of himself. I told you to install the stabilizer, not mess with the engine. But boss, Chuba, the menace barked, backhanding his self with the helmet. If I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. Let me know before you get an idea to fiddle with something. This is why I don't use you guys anymore. The clone visibly wilted beneath Naruto's vicious verbal assault, and Anakin might have found the whole affair rather comical. Were it not for the fierce flush of anger wrapped around the hunter's visage. Tipuna, he barked again, flinging his helmet on the ground. Naruto, what's wrong? My baby. Naruto wailed, flinging a hand toward his beloved vessel. She's ruined. Ruined I tell you. Without a new engine, she'll never fly again. Anakin, doing his best not to laugh, hazarded a glance at Naruto's baby the ship of which he was so terribly proud. Named after the village from whence he hailed, the Konoha was a massive YT-1250 freighter, its disc-like circumference swathing the slave huts in shadow, nearly equal in size and scale to that of a J-Type 327 Nubian Royal Starship vessel. It was a force to be reckoned with an arm to the teeth. Proton torpedoes, turbolacers, tractor beams, the battered freighter, had suffered so many modifications not all of them strictly legal under Naruto's care it could literally be called a flying arsenal. Unfortunately, constant modification often meant constant maintenance. Naruto, for all his acquired talents since finding himself in this galaxy far, far away, wasn't all that reliable when it came to maintenance. He liked to run the guns and the engines until they were red hot or, at times, until the casing cracked. He pushed the Kanoha like he pushed himself, to its limits and beyond. And in this case, he'd pushed the ship just a tad too hard. This time, he'd ruined the engine. Again. Giorara. 
he snarled, flinging his helmet down upon the sands. Ichu Ta. He might have ranted more, still, had not the flapping of wings reached their ears. Naruto and Anakin turned as one to regard the sound but it was the former who snatched the blaster out his belt and fired at the source. Wado's pain cry rang out like a shot as he toppled to the ground, his left wing seared by the near miss, his pudgy body squirming as he struggled to right himself. Naruto was on him in an insant. Hyo, the hunter roared, gloved fingers seeking the Toydarian's throat and failing to find it, closed around one of his spindly arms instead. Hyo, Wado escuaked in surprise, his wings beating furtively against the air as he tried to free himself from the Mandalorian's crushing grip, but to no avail. Apparently, he had yet to realize the severity of the situation. Yowling in pain, the Toydarian found himself dragged down to the ground and hauled forward, forced to face the smoking ruin of Naruto's vessel, towering over them all like an avenging angel. Duh. Wado rasped out. Why is your ship still here, Hunter? What you want? Don't play dumb. Naruto gestured with his free hand, indicating the smoking innards of the Konoha. You sold me a bad part. Now my engine's shot to hell. For a moment, just a moment, Anakin thought he saw Wado's mouth twist into a knowing smile. Sith spit. You can always pay for new engine. The Toydarian's voice was thick with desperation. I sell you one. Cheap, yes, a million trogots. Anakin felt his heart skip a beat. Engines were by no means cheap, especially on Tatooine, especially at Wado's prices. Naruto hissed in a sharp intake of breath. Apparently he'd reached the same conclusion. He's Hapata Nopa. He barked back at Wado. I'm not going to pay that and you know it. I've been saving that money for SHMI and Annie. Not you, you cheating little. Is not my fault, Outlander. Wado cried in protest. You kill me, you get nothing yik. Wado's defiance evaporated as the bounty hunter jammed a blaster into his bulbous nose. There was an audible clack as he flicked the setting from stun to kill, and Anakin knew in his heart that there would be no stopping Naruto this time. He could see madness in the man's eyes now, nearly a decade of pent-up fury and exasperation tamped down, rising now to the fore in the wake of this sudden and unexpected incident. And weren't his eyes meant to be blue? All Anakin could see was those sinister scarlet not sapphire orbs peering down at Watto. You have three seconds to convince me not to shoot you in the face. W wait. Watto sputtered, eyes bulging. SHMI made no effort to come to his aid. She merely ushered Anakin behind her. The boy dared to peek out from around his mother's leg and found only a chilling complacency in the hunter's eyes. His face reflected nothing. It was as if he were set in stone, unflinching, you moving. Whatever frenzied emotion he'd glimpsed was gone now, replaced by a frightening lack of emotion. Naruto radiated nothing but resolve. He would shoot Wado this time and lose no sleep over it. 1. I give you discount. The junk dealer pleaded. 2. I give you the woman for free. For a moment Naruto hesitated, and Anakin thought Wado might have won, that the man might actually cease his countdown. Then his features tightened and the rage was back in full force. His boot struck the Toydarian in the stomach, pinning him against a nearby bulkhead, his blaster swinging, tracking with the movement. No, Wado yowled, flinging both arms before his face in a feeble attempt to ward off the blaster bolt. 3. Naruto's finger tightened on the trigger, his words nearly lost over the deafening roar of an unseen engine. There was a muffled crack. Anakin flinched. SHMI gasped. Wado screamed as the blaster bolt slammed into his shoulder. The shot wrenched him from the hunter's grip and flung him down into the sand like a rag doll. Huddy's curses spilled from his split lip like a torrent of warm mud, the smacking syllables nearly indistinguishable from one another as the Toydarian clutched at his wound and shrieked his fury. Naruto seemed to take no satisfaction in the act. This implacable warrior merely tossed the Toydarian a medkit and continued on as though nothing had happened. Anakin wondered how the man had missed. He'd seen Naruto hit his mark from miles away. For him to have missed at point-blank range was something of an impossibility. Then he heard it. Saw it. Naruto stood still as a god, his eyes tracking something unseen. But not for long. Even as Anakin looked on he saw it in the distance, a sleek starship, gleaming silver in the harsh light of the twin sons of Tatooine. He watched, dumbfounded, as it forsook the port and instead roared past overhead and into the desert. Naruto barked out a laugh, it was a deep, throaty sound. Anakin swung around in surprise, alarmed by the sudden sound of exultation. He watched as a slow smile spread across the man's face, formerly devoid of mirth, now wide and bright with unconstrained delight. Well, what have we here? He murmured to himself. He turned toward Watto, kicked the medkit closer to the flailing Toydarian, leaving the junk dealer to fumble at it with his good arm. Naruto's boot stamped down upon the kit, holding it in place. If I find out you cheated me, Dickut, there'll be nowhere in the galaxy you can hide. 
Without another word he pressed a button on his wrist-mounted communicator. His jetpack roared to life with a flare of flame and sound, nearly deafening Anakin. And then the hunter was gone, shooting into the belly of his ship. There was a harsh clatter, punctuated by a triumphant cry, and then Naruto was back again, bearing what looked like a set of macro binoculars. He trained them in the direction the ship had gone, his smile growing with every second. Abruptly he closed them down, leaving Anakin to wonder, alongside his mother, exactly what he'd seen out there. Ha, huh? he chuckled. Things are looking up for you today, Watto. What makes you say that? The Toydarian wheezed. His beady eyes narrowed with suspicion upon the man who'd just shot him. Because, and here Naruto's gaze did glitter with amusement. I do believe I just found myself a new engine. So alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 2. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Also check out the story and author Neon Zenjetsu on fanfiction.net. Press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.